How much did our argument against the Clippers drive you to ultimately lead the Warriors? Hey, what's up, man? I appreciate you coming on. It's my show, Chips. Obviously, it stems from exploring that chip on your shoulder, what drives us and makes us who we are and why we're here today. So thank you. No doubt, man. Thanks for having me, bro. So take me on the journey. Coach Brown, your first coach, how was that and what did he teach you? He taught me the uh, fundamentals. I mean, it felt like fundamentals of the game, but it was like truly fundamentals of life what it's gonna take for me to survive as a human being, a maturing human being. He put this game in front of me, told me the fundamentals of it, the balance of the game, the history of it. I just started to understand that for one, but also started to see life a little bit clearer too. It was one of those special times in my life that I always revert back to, you know? You hear the cliche saying of everything you do, do a game speed. To me, that is the most cliche <laughs> statement in the world. Yeah. Except for when it comes to you, you actually do every rep game speed. Does that come from him or does that come from somewhere else? Yeah, he, that, I mean, he built the foundation and the cliche stuff. I mean, I am cliche. That, I mean, I'm simple, I'm efficient, I'm to the point. That's what my game is. And a lot of the best stuff to me is cliche. So I just tried to approach every workout like a game every game like a workout. And then you, you go to high school and, and you went to several different high schools. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> how did you feel about that then? And looking back on that, how do you feel about it now? So back then, I didn't know it was any different. I was listening to my Coach Brown, my mom, my pops. Like this was where the best competition was. So I would switch schools every year to move up a level. People have tried to make that connection of you being at several different high schools to now you being on three different teams. What do you say to that or those people? Yeah, I mean, I feel as though at each spot, even in high school, my game was growing so fast. I need to be in a different environment to see how farther I can go. And, and, and why, why Texas? In my opinion, Texas is a football school. Yeah, it is. It is. It's a football state. But underneath all of that is some incredible athletes on the basketball side. It was just perfect situation. And then being in Austin, it was like, you know, the city itself, you know, it wasn't a normal college town. It was like being in a major city. So it was perfect for me. I know growing up in Saginaw, for me, uh, being the tallest kid, everybody always wanted, to, wanted me to play center. Mm -hmm. And I was fortunate enough to have my uncle who just taught me how to dribble and taught me guard skills. Mm -hmm. But I still always end up throwing at the center. Whereas you're seven feet, uh, and you, you'll never admit it, but you're seven <laughs> feet. You never played the four in your life till you came to go to state, really. And I played we were, a little bit in college because I couldn't dribble that well, but I was still on the perimeter most mm -hmm. of the time. And when we went small, that's when you would play the four. Whose idea was it like to never just stick you on the block because you were always taller than everybody? Coach Brown and Coach Chucky. Like, they would see me every day just running up and down the court, like, no ball in my hand, just running around with kids. And they seen my agility outside, running, playing football and stuff, so they seen that I wasn't just a stiff. So, so I mean, you're calling me a stiff, all right, back, <laughs> all right. I mean, no, nah, you ain't no <laughs> stiff, though. And you're not even big, bro. You're like 6'6", <laughs> six, six, like, and you play bigger than what you really are. But most guys that's tall and skinny, they can't really move at the same time. And, uh, you know, I always wanted to be a point guard and, shooting guard, I was just growing so fast. So some coaches did just stick me underneath the basket, but if I get a rebound, I go coast to coast. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. If, I, if I, I shoot a jump shot here and there. So I was showing flashes, but it wasn't like this. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Yeah. I developed this over time. I remember um, reading a statement where you said, I'm tired of being number two. I was the number two pick. I was the number two player in the country. Where was that coming from? Mm -hmm. Like, and why? Did you feel that? Like, yeah, because we had just lost the, in the finals. Mm -hmm. And I felt like we was right there every game. And people was like, man, good job. Man. Y'all did great. Like, you guys are young. Y'all be right back. And I was like, I don't care about that. I wanted to win that series, and I want to win a championship. And that's where that came from. I was just, it, people wanted me to accept being second so much. That was never my mentality ever, always to win the game. And, you know, I appreciated people, like, respecting my game, but I was like, I wanted more for myself. And at that point, that's how I was feeling. 
first nine years in OKC, and then you decide that you leave in OKC. And you ultimately decide to come to the Warriors, knowing that the scrutiny would be there, um, knowing that you know everybody would say the Warriors were this great team, but you still ultimately made the decision. Why was that? Was that driven by, I don't give a fuck what y'all think this is good for me? Or was that just, you know, uh, was it strictly just a basketball decision? It was a basketball decision, but I knocked down the, like, not giving a fuck ladder with that too. You know what I'm saying? It kind of knocked down two birds with one stone with that. But it was mainly, I felt like I was the absolute perfect fit with what you guys were doing on both ends of the ball. And I knew my game had reached a point where I need to really see what that looked like. And I thought that was just a no-brainer. I would do that shit a million times. And, you know, again, I, would, I didn't second guess at all. And I knew that's what I wanted to do when I was going into these meetings. But I, I really just had to confirm, go through the process. But like, I knew from watching the games, just looking at interviews, just seeing everything that y'all are about, it's like that's the way I wanted to play and that's the way I need to go to you know, continue to keep getting better as a player. So once I tunnel vision on that, I knew everything would come afterwards and it was just a, just me going through that experience and see how I was gonna deal with it. And shit, it was, it, was, it, went, it went perfect. You then do three years there, two championships, would have been three had you not got hurt. Easily. But in my opinion, after year two, you were over it. You were, you were done with it and you were on to the next thing. But we had the opportunity to three-peat. And in my mind, what brought you back to Golden State for year three was just the opportunity to three-peat, but it, it didn't feel right for you no more. Am I right, wrong? That's interesting because a lot of people, that's just a talk around me the last few years, and I get what people are saying because before I got to Golden State, I was just happy-go-lucky, like just bright-eyed to the experience, not knowing what was ahead. By the first year, I knew exactly what we needed to do in order for us to win every night. I knew what my role was to the T. Teams before, I didn't quite know what my role was every night. Did I have to be the scorer? Did I have to be the facilitator? Did I have to get other guys involved? Did I have to make threes? I knew exactly what my role was and I locked on it with so much focus and determination to not fuck around every day. And you've seen it. From workouts to practices, shoot arounds, film, I was super locked in and it made people on the outside look at me like, hold on, is he enjoying this? When I dive into something like that, with that level of focus, I don't want to be anywhere else in life. That's the most enjoyable experience I ever had after that first one. If that was the case, I wouldn't have played 78 games that year. I would have just waited to the end of the season and try to play in the playoffs. I played every game. I went hard every day. I cared about every matchup, no matter who was on the floor. Just my look and feel is like energetic or opening as it was before. And I liked that. I liked that I was closed off and focused on my work. I just maybe should have communicated that with more people who were interested in knowing what I was going through, but I had the most fun locking in <laughs> and, and, and completing the task. You know what I'm saying? Because I knew we was going to win mm -hmm. every night. And it's rare to get to that point as an NBA player, yeah. knowing you're going to win every night. So I just try to focus in and stay in the moment more than anything. And for my, for my own personal um, sanity, because I've been getting my ass kicked ever since you left. So just for my own personal sanity, how much did our argument against the Clippers drive you to ultimately lead the Warriors? It wasn't the argument, it was the, f the way that everybody, Steve Kerr act like it didn't happen, Bob Myers and tried to just discipline you and think that that would put the mask over everything. I really felt like that was such a big situation for us as a group. The first time we went through something like that, we had to get that shit all out. I remember watching The Last Dance, and when Scotty didn't go into the game, the whole team in the locker room said, Scotty, that was fucked up that you did that. We needed that. We just needed to throw all of that shit out on the table and say, yo, Dre, K, like, that was fucked up that we even had to go through that. Let's just wipe our hands with that and go, f go finish the task. I don't think we did that and we tried to dance around it. I just didn't like how all of that, just the vibe between all of that, it just made shit weird to me. And I'd rather us be who we say we are, family first, communication is key. Like, I, we didn't show that and I, that's what rubbed me the wrong way more than anything. When we landed back from LA, I sat in the 
Hazel was sitting in the car for an hour and 45 minutes. They pulled me in that room at Signature for an hour and 45 minutes, and they tried to tell me, you need to apologize. And I told them, I'll talk to Kay, but y'all aren't going to tell me what I need to say. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they went on for an hour and 45 minutes talk, saying a bunch of bullshit. And ultimately, they realized, all right, we're not getting through to him. We're going to try again in the morning. And so we met the next morning, and they said, all right, you slept on it. You ready to apologize? And I told them right then and there, I said, y'all about to fuck this up. I said, the only person that can make this right is me and Kay. And there's nothing that y'all can do, and y'all are going to fuck this up. And in my opinion, they fucked it up. I think so, too. And they told me right then and there, like, we're going to suspend you for this game. I laughed in their face, literally laughed in their face. And Bob said to me, he said, uh, wow, that was not the reaction I was looking for or expecting. And I said, well, either I'm going to laugh in your face or I'm going to cuss you the fuck out. So you pick, I'm going to choose laugh. So I, I think what you're doing is funny, and so I'm going to laugh. And so it's interesting to hear you say essentially the same thing that I told them that day. But, uh, you know, and, and moving past that, um, kind of along those same lines, you've now played with Russ, who I think has an incredible chip on his shoulder that sometimes goes too far. Mm -hmm. uh, myself, who has a chip on my shoulder that sometimes <laughs> goes too far. Uh, Kyrie, who has a chip on his shoulder that sometimes goes too far. And James, who mm -hmm. has a chip on his shoulder that probably sometimes <laughs> goes too far. And playing with all the guys that you play with that you could say, ah, he probably go way too far. We all go too far, bro. And we all got major chips on our shoulders. There's a million of us. Imagine a million people trying to walk, run into this door right now. Somebody gonna get elbowed, kicked, pushed over. Like we all trying to fit into a one peg spot. A hundred of millions of us trying to fit into these 12, 15 spots on teams. So we got to have that chip on our shoulder. And I always appreciate that, appreciate the people that acknowledge that it's tough to make it to the league. And I had to kick a lot of motherfuckers down to get here. I had to shun a lot of my friends and a lot of the sacrifice, a lot of the personal shit that I loved as a kid so I can get here. So we all, all of us naturally are underdogs, got chips on our shoulders because it's hard to make it to this point. But the person that went too far was always Draymond Green. He, he, uh, I mean, to the point where I felt like you were trying to establish that you're not playing around. Like, you're not going to walk over me, even though I was a second round pick and I'm undersized and I'm, I'm not as skilled as y'all want me to be or I don't play the way y'all traditionally like for people my size to play. I felt that same way about Russell Westbrook because of his story. I felt that same way about James Hart because I know his story from like, when these dudes was kids, what they had to go through as everyday people, not just on the court. It's hard to make it through life every day. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Where some of these people come from, you know? So I started understanding that about people. I'm realizing like, now I see why they show their ego, they show the pride that they have, they show the chip that they have on their shoulder because it's hard as shit to make it Thanks. every day. You know what I'm saying? But you pushed it to the limit where it's like, it's cool for me to be who I am and be uh, and not apologize for it all the time mm -hmm. because you don't mean you ain't mean no harm to anybody but shit that you want it done you want it done and I, we all respected that and we all kind of looked up to that as guys that come into the league and want to fit into the system so bad mm -hmm. you know what i'm saying Facts. like wanting to be a part of this whole thing then you realize you see dudes who just going by their own little pace and it's like oh, that's more so of my rhythm you mm -hmm. know what i'm saying so a lot of the guys that i play with from russ to james to Kai to Steph to Clay, they all kind of move to the beat of their own drum. That encourages a lot of people to do the same shit, not just basketball players, but people in general who just watch us. Dealing with everybody every single day, I start thinking like that, and I start seeing the beauty in all of this shit. Mm -hmm. To watch you early on in your career, like you said, you was the happy one. You was the kid that carried the backpack. Nike started a backpack line because you <laughs> yeah. always, and you, to this day, you still, still carry a backpack it, yeah. all the time. Um, and so there's this common misconception that you're not the kid that carries the backpack anymore. I still think you're the kid that loves basketball <laughs> and carry a backpack. Yeah. But over the course of the years, your answers 
to the media, how you deal with the media has changed. Why is that? Is that just who you grew into? Is that because of the way they act with certain shit? Where did that? I felt like the media knew more than me. I almost had them on a pedestal of like, they got more history, knowledge of the game, they more experienced than me in this area of the NBA. So once I started to get more experience and realize like, oh no, they, they, they can never be what I am mm -hmm. or know what I know or understand it the way I understand it. Some of the questions, you know, they didn't seem so intelligent to me anymore. People wanted to praise me more than I liked or hate me more than I liked make a big deal out of so much other shit. And I was just like, you know, this game is simple to me. So some of the stuff that y'all asking really doesn't move me the way it used to. I just, you know, start to see life different. I can see this game different. So, you know, of course my answers and questions, you know, about what goes on is gonna be different too. So I just chalk that up to just maturity and experience. And speaking of media, uh, social media, obviously uh, we were teammates when you, when you got caught with the burner account. <laughs> One thing I love uh, about the Burner account is everything that you said on the Burner account, you just started to say on Kevin Durant's account. Yeah. A lot of people don't like it, as you know, mm. most people voice. Uh, they don't like how you respond to some fans or how you respond to this, how you are always tweeting. What do you make of people's reaction to you responding to fans? And if you think something, you send it. Yeah. I just think people are still upset that I went to the Warriors and a lot of people who are Cavs fans who enjoy watching the Cavs beat y'all before, um, which is a lot of people. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize that until I got <laughs> there. A lot of people enjoy seeing y'all lose in 2016. And a lot of those people were upset that we were so good. Mm -hmm. And they're still upset because you do the same shit on Twitter. Mm -hmm. Damian Lillard does the same shit on mm -hmm. Twitter. CJ McCollum does the same shit on Twitter. We all do the same shit on Twitter, but for me, it's a problem. I mean, I chalk it up to just me being so good at what I do and playing with a team that was so great and we fit so well, nobody likes a great thing. Mm -hmm. And I was, I guess, I was the cause of that great thing because I came and joined. So it's way deeper than what I do on Twitter. And I understand that. And it's funny to me at this point because you can't erase what we did. You're never gonna erase it. And you know you love watching us play. You know yeah. what I'm saying? So the best, I think it's the best era of basketball ever, in my opinion. But that's really what it is. So many people still upset with me that I chose to play basketball for the Golden State Warriors, which is sad at this point, because it's almost a, a decade later mm -hmm. since I made that decision, you know what I'm saying? That's never going to stop me from engaging with fans, because at the end of the day, I'm only talking about basketball. Mm -hmm. I'm not diving into politics. I'm not telling you how you should live. I'm not flexing my money or my power or none of that shit on you. I'm just literally talk about the game, mm -hmm. you know, and what I see. And I don't think it harms anyone. I would love to see D-Book win a championship. But in my opinion, the finals does not compare to Warriors, Cavs, Warriors. Nah. Mm -mm. Even, even Warriors, Raptors. Do you have any regrets about that, knowing that we probably would have won five more championships? No, nah, I, I don't have any regrets at all. I felt like we did exactly what we were supposed to do. And I wish you would have three-peated because that's rare. And we were like right there. Um, but I don't have any regrets at all because I feel like if we just stay healthy with the Nets, we had a great chance to finish mm -hmm. it too. Mm -hmm. So, um, no, nah, I mean, being hurt for that year really changed my perspective on everything that I was doing and everything that I did before. I looked at that time with playing with the Warriors as so special to me, but it was time to move on. So now you're, you're, you're in this space with the Nets and, you know, everybody has made this big deal about Kyrie and, you know, his beliefs and uh, him missing games and just like we all do, he got his shit. Yeah. And a lot of people are now saying that is what's going to cost y'all ultimately of reaching where y'all want to reach. What do you make of that? I mean, I just think people don't like Kyrie because he wanted to leave Cleveland and he wanted to leave Boston. I don't think it's any deeper than that. He doesn't harm anyone. He hasn't said anything that's disrespectful to anybody. His game is beautiful to watch. I just think people don't like the decisions on what he chooses to play. Um, and they, they sort of amplify everything because everybody in this league has their shit. They mm -hmm. may say something over a course of six months that may, everybody may not agree with. That's just nature of our, our business. You know, when you're that good at what you do, 
everything is a little amplified and sometimes it's a little extra, you know? So what Kyrie does, especially in our building, nobody is making a big deal out of it. Just like a lot of shit we did in our building, we didn't give a shit if Clay missed practice. Like, <laughs> we, <laughs> who can, like, as long as you're there for the games, as long as you, you know, you healthy enough to play, like, we didn't give a shit. Like, when you, when you and coach cursed each other out, literally, as <laughs> soon as the practice was over, it was cool. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, so it was like, everybody's mature enough to understand, like, we come to work, we handle our business, and you be who you are. Family, you have no kids. You're now 32. About I'm 31. I got, I got three kids. I'm, I'm 31, so I, you know, I took a little different route. You're OG <laughs> now, man. <laughs> but you, you have no kids. Why? Do you want kids? Ultimately, do you not want kids? I mean, that's a, that's a big commitment, for one. And I always felt like I was just really zoned in on my work in my alone time, in my free time. Um, too much for me to like lock in on something like that, you know? And eventually I do want that, but the older I get, I think is the better because I'm maturing more, knowing myself more, understanding my situation a little bit more. So if I were to invite someone in or combine my life with another person, you know, it'd be perfectly perfect at this time as opposed to me 10 years ago, I wouldn't know what to do. So mm -hmm. I think I'm uh, as long as I wait, you know, uh, it's only gonna be for the better. Do you ever worry that the longer you wait, your kid won't understand who Kevin Durant is. Yeah, I'm glad he won't understand. Because I don't that? want him to have to feel like he's pressured in this bubble to do what I did, you know? And as long as I'm playing, like, this bubble is always going to be about making it to the NBA. So if you see a little KD out here, nothing but you expecting him to be a, a basketball player. So, like, I don't know if my kid is even going to be that tall or fall into the game like I fell into it. Who knows? So I'd rather just me tell him, you know, over time what I did. I don't want any pressure for anybody that's coming into my world to do what I like to do. I want them to explore things on their own. So what's next for you? You got, uh, you know, probably... 10 more years left of hooping. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> what comes after that? Have you gotten there yet, or are you still just so locked in on basketball that it's just that? You know, I definitely want to stay involved in the game. Um, I'm learning so much now. I don't know where I could use it at. Coaching, GM, ownership. I feel like I'm gathering so much knowledge that I could be useful in any part of this game. Um, but outside of that, I have other interests in tech world, media space, art, all of that stuff that, you know, I enjoy doing my leisure time, you know, I want to get involved in at some point. Uh, but for now, you know what I'm about. <laughs> you know what, I'm, what I enjoy to do every day. So until that time is up, then we'll see what happens. But I feel like I'm setting up stuff on the back end of things that I can have options. You know, I think people look at us and they say, oh man, you play basketball for a living, you should be happy, which is great, right? Like you love basketball, I love basketball. Being able to do that and make the type of money we make is incredible. But with that comes a lot of fucking scrutiny, comes a lot of headaches. What is the happiest you've been as a professional? I don't even, I don't even like to use the word happiness. That's just a fleeting feeling. It can just go so up and down. I don't want to chase that feeling. It's just not a, a efficient way for me to live. I feel like just having peace and, and really uh, Simply just enjoying being alive every day is the best place for me to be. You know, I don't want to be happy and sad. Like, I don't even want to have to go through that. I just want to just kind of float through life. I experience so much. I just want to take on every experience for what it is and enjoy it in a moment, you know? Mm -hmm. so I don't want to chase happiness, you know? So I just try to stay even. I respect that. Appreciate it, bro. Man, that was incredible talk, yes, my sir. brother. Thank you. Thank you. No doubt. That's hey. chill. It's a wrap. This is going to be an incredible interview, by the way. <laughs> this is going to go crazy. <laughs>